Welcome back, fellow glue sniffers, to the third and final episode of Mustang Madness. I had found a few pictures online of Korean War Mustangs with the USAF marking on the opposite wing as the roundel, and I liked the look of that. So arming up the Cricut machine, I made a simple mask and then sprayed it on. Airfix decals tend to go on very nicely with the use of Microset and Microsol, and this kit was no exception. Airfix decals also tend to be very thin with minimal carrier film, so when it comes to weathering afterwards, you don't have to worry about sanding them down. So to summarize this part of the build, it's pretty much drama free. For the Tamiya Mustang, I chose to use aftermarket decals because Tamiya decals are always very thick and can be a little bit troublesome to work with. I like the look of the big, beautiful doll Mustang, so I chose to grab lifelike decals aftermarket set. I always feared that that checker nose decal set would be a little bit troublesome to work with with any brand, but lifelike decals has a few cuts in the decals that make them a little bit easier to get into place and to shape to the Tamiya kit's nose. These decals are very thin, so by applying some micro set and micro saw, they conform very nicely as well. Included in the set are all the variations of Big Beautiful Doll. So I chose to go with this one because there's a couple different colors and it didn't have too much going on. I like the checkered nose, but then doing checkered wingtips and a checkered tail seemed to be a little bit too much in my opinion. But with that set, you can do anything you wish. I chose to put the Edward Rockets onto the Airfix Mustang because they are thinner and had more detail. I may not have been giving Airfix a fair review in my last video. I won't deny that there's some fit issues and some quality issues with the kits, but you have to remember that these kits are priced in the $30 to $40 range Canadian. If Tamiya released a new mold Mustang, it would more likely be in the price range of $60 Canadian, same as the Spitfire. So in short, Airfix kits are not worse than the other brands, they're just coming in at a lower price point, so you don't get the same quality as those higher priced brands. I hope that clears things up and slows down some of the hate mail. And as for Revel, I'll only touch their Reebok stuff from other brands. One of my favorite things to do in 148 and larger scales is to add the cast effects to the bomb. It adds more to the detail and just makes them more visually interesting. One thing I noticed with Korean War bombs and World War II bombs is they have green on them is not a simple green. They have different shades and colors going on and textures. So I decided to try to recreate that using some wet blending with Vallejo brush paints. The nice thing about Ordnance is it adds some nice contrast to the all silver color of the Mustang. I'm recovering from a concussion the last two weeks, so that's probably why the Ordnance is on the Mustang before the weathering's even been done. It's going to make things a little more difficult, but we'll just seal it all in with a clear coat anyways. Now, I owe you guys a third Mustang, and this is going to add to the madness part of the build. In my quest to find the perfect natural metal finish, I tried some Uno Mr. Color Black as a base. And at the end of the day, it's a lot simpler than doing gloss coats, polishing, and all the other stuff I've been trying. And by starting with two thin layers of Mr. Color Uno Black, I then come in with a wet coat and follow that with Mr. Leveling Thinner. I've done this all as a single take, so you can see that there's been no tricks or polishing or anything done or any cuts. So you can see how things start to dry and cure with this paint. The leveling thinner melts that Uno you know, black a little bit, and at the end, it gives you a nice glass-like mirror finish that requires no further work before metals. As that Mr. Leveling Thinner starts to reactivate the paint, you can see the magic happening. I love chemistry. I've seen some other model builders on YouTube absolutely hammering the AK Extreme Metal paints on or misting them, and this time around, I decided to try some thin multiple coats to see if that built up a better shine. I also made sure to give the paint about a half hour to cure between coats. But for some reason, after all of this precaution, the paint would still wipe off a little bit two days later when it's being touched. So I don't know what's going on there, but I've read in a form that after some other people have put on their AK Extreme Metal, they sealed it with two clear coats just to try to prevent it. Maybe I should also invest in some white cotton gloves. That might prevent it as well. In case you were wondering, this is the Tamiya P51B Mustang, and there's pretty much no issues with this kit for fit, putting it together. The only place there's a little bit of filler is on the underside of the aircraft at the exact same spot that the D model Mustang had to be cleaned up. This paint scheme was also chosen by my six-year-old, the model kid, and he really liked that blue nose. So I was able to steal some of the decals from the Edward kit to put on this one, because if you've built a Tamiya kit before, you know that the decals are very thick. And this is the blue nose P51B kit that Tamiya released, and the decals in that kit are even thicker. They're twice as thick as normal. 
but they do give you a couple extra figures that I've set aside for some kits in the future. I'm going to have to do another Blue Nose Mustang because I absolutely love that bright blue color. Now time to do Invasion Stripes. These are something I've only done one other time, so I decided to use the Cricut machine to kind of cheat and be lazy. So instead of measuring off tape and cutting it with a ruler and try to keep everything nice and straight, I plugged in all that information into the Cricut and had it cut the stripes for me. I didn't know how transparent the Edward decals were going to be, so I created a mask for where the insignia was going to be sitting just in case those stripes would show through. I also added all five stripe widths together to create a template so I could mask off the parts of the Mustang that were not getting painted. Once all that work had been done and everything was masked, I could come in with some white to start the stripes. One thing I wish I had done differently, and I'm going to tell you because it's going to save you some hassle as well, is when I was first doing the wings and fuselage white portions of the invasion stripes, I used Tamiya XF2. It didn't stick to the lacquer clear coat that well, and it was kind of a double-edged sword. I wanted the lacquer clear coat down just to protect the paint underneath, so if I made a mistake, and you've seen this in my hurricane video, I could just use a wet cotton bud and wipe away the overspray or anything like that. The problem is when I lifted my masking off of the white for the black part of the stripes, it tore up the paint with it. So when I did the flaps on this kit, instead of Tamiya XF2 flat white for paint as a base, I used Mr. Surfacer 1500 white. That way it would etch the primer a little bit. And because it was such a small part, it was a great test piece because if there was a mistake, I could just wipe the paint off and soak it, whatever. But the white primer worked perfectly. When I put, took the masking off, there was no issues, nothing lifted, and that's the route I'm gonna take in the future for any invasion stripes. Or maybe I'll set off some purists and actually brush paint them on. While I'm setting up to fire the black under the invasion stripes, why don't you, in the comment section below, write something that you find challenging about building models and something you're trying to improve on. As always, I'm very open to any critiques or criticism because it helps me build better content to bring to you on the channel. If you're new to this channel or you haven't already, make sure you click the like and subscribe button and set it to all for notifications. You'll notice on the community tab of this channel, I'm always updating photos and bringing you more content behind the scenes. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook as well. Another great tip and one that I'm not doing a very good example of here is whenever you're removing masking or tape to try to do it at an angle offset to your paint. That way it reduces any chances of lifting the paint or damaging it. You can see that example on the top here. It's a little more clear there's an angle. While we're talking about masking, I'm very excited to have a Silhouette Cameo 3 on loan from a friend to try out in my basement. I, you can With that machine, you can do some very small lettering. And the smallest cutting I've seen someone else do is doing USAF roundels with a one millimeter wide bar perfectly straight at a perfect 90 degree angle. There's no way the Cricut machine I am using right now can hit that. So what that means for you as viewers is you can count on a video coming out very soon where I compare the two machines, what they're capable of, and what they mean to us in the modeling world. To get back to this build, I found that the invasion stripes were too clean and too tidy, so I tried to break them up a little bit with some thin brush painting just to see if I could get some small brush strokes in there. It shows up really well on the white paint, not so well on the black, and some of the strokes are too long to have been created by a person in 148 scale unless they have a 12 foot long reach. With all the painting now done, it's time to seal it all in with two coats of clear. The Edward decals were very thin and had a tendency to roll in on themselves a little bit, so when I was doing the HO decal on the fuselage, it tore, so instead of trying to fix it, I just decided to make a mask and paint it on. The carrier film for the Edward decals is also very thin on the same level of the lifelike decals, and with a little bit of micro sol, it completely disappeared and gives you a painted on look. For curved lines on spinners, I'll use electrical tape instead of vinyl tape, because I should probably buy some of that at this point, and any little bit of overspray, I'll correct with some Vallejo brush paint. One trick to painting masking is to make sure you're shooting 90 degrees at the object you're masking. Also, 
if you use a knife to cut your edge rather than use the edge of tape, you'll get a much cleaner line because on the sides of tape, you'll get all your dust and crap sticking to it. So you don't get a nice seal along whatever you're painting. For the exhaust stains and gun smoke stains, I use some highly thinned down Tamiya paint. Because the paint is so thin, it gives you a lot of control over how sooty you want your exhaust staining to be. When you're doing your exhaust staining, you also want to remember that an aircraft engine is pulsing out the exhaust. It's not constant along the side of the aircraft. Every time the cylinder hits the top of the exhaust stroke in a two-stroke or a four-stroke cycle, it's pushing the exhaust smoke out for only a split second before it starts sucking air in again. So if you have six cylinders, all with its own exhaust pipe, you're going to have a pattern of exhaust coming out instead of a constant stream. And if you're not sure what that looks like, if you ever watch a Merlin engine from above, you'll see that as the exhaust comes out as sort of like a sputtering pattern. I think the worst thing I did to the Blue Nose Mustang was hit it with a semi-gloss clear because it really took the shine away from the aircraft. Alice, Alice, shh. I can't get one to me. There's one. Yep, those are six chickens we're raising right now. And that post before wasn't a lie. At this point, doing three kits of the exact same build was really starting to wear out. So when it came to weathering, I really had to apply myself to do a somewhat decent job. I went a little too crazy with the rust pigments and after I had everything laid out, came back in with some enamel thinner to kind of thin them and blend them in. That's the nice thing about pigments and oils is they take so long to dry that they're very easy to clean up and correct afterwards. With Mustang Madness now coming to a close, I'll summarize quickly by saying that I would build all three of these kits again, the Edward kit, Tamiya, and Airfix. The only really negative thing I can say about the Tamiya kits is the lack of detail in the cockpits, but that gives you a lot of options to scratch build and really add your own flair to it. For just $30 Canadian, that kit's really the bargain out of the three. I know the last two episodes it sounds like I've been really tearing apart Airfix, but I just want people to know that when you get into their kits, its quality isn't going to be the same as Tamiya and Edward. However, if you put in the effort, you can still have a really nice looking model kit at the end. The Edward Mustang, however, has the best details for the cockpit, wheelbase, and even without the photo etch stuff, it still sits above the other two Mustangs. The only issue with the Edward Mustang is getting that cowling to align properly in the front because there's no locating pin. Other than that, it's a beautiful kit. I will definitely have to get one to replace the kit that got melted by thinner. If Edward releases a weekend edition of that kit, it'll be a real moneymaker because the only thing you'll have to add is the seatbelts and you'll have a beautiful kit still at a lower cost. That brings us to the end of Mustang Madness. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it helps you make an informed decision when you look at buying your next Mustang kit. This is The Model Guy, and I'll see you next time.